my name is Peter Mancall. I teach history and anthropology at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. I am a specialist in um, uh, early modern Atlantic history and early American history and Native American history, primarily from the 16th through the 18th centuries. So we're here to talk about your latest book, Nature and Culture in the Early Modern Atlantic, that came out in, I think, spring 2018. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, maybe one of the sort of usual questions to ask, what inspired you to write the book? Like, well, was there sort of a, like an inspiring moment or was the context to, to the book? And um, what, does it place, what, what place does it have for you in your your oeuvre, in your work? Well, the specific context for writing the book was I received an invitation uh, to go to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia mm -hmm. to deliver the first Mellon Distinguished Lectures in the Humanities. Okay, well. And I said, what would you like me to talk about? And they said, what would you like to talk about? So <laughs> it really, it was just a question of, of me thinking, what story could I tell in three lectures? Because okay. it was a three lecture series. Yeah. So I've been interested in, in environmental history since uh, since I was in graduate school. Uh, in my second year in graduate school, a little book by, Will, by Bill Cronin called Changes in the Land came out, and it uh, had a deep impact on me as I thought about what I was going to write my doctoral dissertation about. And my dissertation ended up being called Environment and Economy, and so I've been flirting with doing environmental history throughout my career. There's actually a fair amount of environmental issues in much of what I've been working on. And so fast forward some years uh, as I continued to do that and my work shifted. I'd started in the 18th century and I shifted to the 16th century and I shifted really to try to understand in a deeper way the encounters between um, native peoples on the east coast of what is now the United States mm -hmm. uh, and Europeans and uh, the questions of environmental history, how environmental history was practiced were really on my mind. And environmental history mm -hmm. as a field is really, and I'd say it's a modern field. That's really about the 19th and 20th century. It has certain presumptions behind it. Yep, and mm -hmm. in the early modern period, the sort of analog uh, was really sort of history of science in some sense, a very sort of different set of ideas. Um, but historians of science and some art historians were asking questions about evidence that I thought was relevant to how we understand relations between people and the environment. So this little book, these lectures, which then became this book, uh, were really my chance to sort of say, okay, how can I sort of take a, a question? How do we get from, say, the age of Columbus, on the one hand, if you want to think about a European sense, to the planting of permanent English colonies in North America, so Jamestown, on the other hand, and how do we think about that uh, from an environmental history perspective? But crucial to that, in the way that I wanted to do that, was though I understood, <coughs> I understood I'd be using European sources. As much as possible, I wanted to integrate indigenous American ways of understanding nature. And so that actually, though in the end, I think it's not the, a dominant theme of the book, or not the dominant theme, that was actually intellectually where I was really pushing it. Yeah. And the other thing I was pushing in the book is a lot of environmental history uh, does not take much advantage of visual evidence. Yes, and no, so true. I wanted to look at these items, this stuff that we have from the 16th and 17th century. So if you look at just the cover of the book, right, here are these beautiful maps. Why are there monsters on these maps? What is that? Are these just literary figments of people's imagination? Or what is that all about? And really try to understand, you know, how a cartographer sitting on the coast of France in the 16th century who's trying to have very accurate coastlines of North America, would at the same time put a sea monster in there. Right? And it seemed to me that it wasn't just a literary or, or a visual device, that there was something deeper there going on, and I wanted to pursue that. Uh, and so integrating the visual throughout, and then rethinking uh, some evidence that we know well, especially near the end of the book, that's sort of what led to the project. So, um, in many ways, kind of also drawing on, on your, your whole kind of work throughout your whole, your whole career, in a certain sense. Yeah, I think so. I mean, my, my, my very first book, which I think no one has ever read, I'm fairly certain, 
Uh, now they will. Uh, well, let's let us hope. <laughs> uh, my very first book dealt with a river valley in upstate Pennsylvania and New York, the Susquehanna Valley. Okay. And I was very interested in how different peoples created economic systems. It's really a book of economic culture, sort of historical economic culture. Uh, so that was there, and that's fed, I think with any of us, one project feeds into another, feeds into another, feeds another. So that project fed into a, a book on Native American alcohol use. Yes. Uh, that little that project then led to an invitation to spend a few months in New Zealand uh, to study Maori alcohol use, uh, and that then uh, really forced me to think about different sources of history, especially oral sources of history. Uh, as it turns out, I was living in Kansas at the time, and and. Lawrence, Kansas is the home of the University of Kansas and Haskell Indian Nations University. So we were having discussions about creating an indigenous studies program in any event, going to New Zealand and spending time with Maori historians and Maori history still maintained orally really made me rethink what is the nature of non-Western sources. Um, and then I was sort of on that track, which seemed fine, uh, when I became obsessed with a 16th century figure, Richard Hacklett the Younger, okay. and then got more into what, how can we understand this early contact period. So this book on nature and culture flowed out of that. It was going to bring together some things that sort of fell off sort of the main line of my research. So I was trying to make a larger point. The book has a couple of large points in it. Mm -hmm. And one of it is, one of the points is, how do we know what we know about nature? Right? And that takes us into who's doing that and what are they doing. And so I thought the insects were a way of getting at that. And I thought that would be a somewhat quirky, admittedly, way of ending the book, but a way that would make people think, oh, everyone is paying attention to nature. They're describing it differently, but that process is universal. What can we take from the differences in interpretation? Okay. Which I, I find super, super interesting and important, especially in that kind of difference between, um, I think, that, and it's maybe we still talk about this in, in this way of indigenous knowledge and then European science. Whereas exactly. your book exactly. is showing, no, it's actually both science, if you like, you know, exactly. because, because indigenous peoples were looking at or were observing in the same detail um, and were acquiring knowledge about their environment or had acquired knowledge about their own environment for ages and, and had a, a, a scientific approach to it in a certain sense that is very comparable. Exactly, and, and I think that's a, it, it, it's, it's a question of sort of, um, of the mentalities, right? I mean, we're trying to, so we recognize, we stipulate that Europeans on the one hand and these American, I call them Americans, right? I mean, yeah. that term in my country now, the United States now, that's problematic. Because I use the term Americans, people think I'm talking about people of European origin, Whatever. But in the 16th century, that term meant native peoples, indigenous peoples, uh, people now in Canada, First Nations peoples. I mean, we're trying to refer to the specific group. Um, but really, it is trying to put them on an equal intellectual stage, on, on the same platform as the Europeans who are coming over. Uh, part of the trick is that the sources that I have, uh, the sources that we have, are mediated. So every source is mediated in some sense, right? Every source. So every travel account that we pick up, and, this, and we know mostly about the Americas because of the travel accounts. So every travel account um, gets into how do I describe this place for people who have never seen it, right? And are likely never going to see it. And so uh, Sir John Eliot, in, in, in his lovely book, The Old World and the New, talks about the problems that Europeans have. Uh, they, 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 they cross the Atlantic Ocean, they come and they're looking out, I'm, like I'm looking at here, they look out and they don't have the words for the colors they want to describe. <laughs> right? I mean, and that is a real sort of a problem. So that's a good sort of recognition of how those texts are mediated, right? They are going to try to describe a place in words for people who've never seen it and they're going to use process of analogous reasoning. They're going to say, this is like this. Their houses are sort of like houses you would see here, except dot, 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 dot. Mm -hmm. So they do that sort of um, reasoning. When you were talking about um, the analogous reading and, and um, about how Europeans had to sort of try and 
describe in in familiar terms to their uh, peers back home or to their people back home what what new things they were seeing, and this is basically kind of what we are um, at least in part looking at in our project context that we are in here, this collaborative research center. And I think I've told you a little bit about this before. So the, the collaborative research center is researching practices of comparing rather than comparison as a method or operation in the sense of comparing A to B. Um, so we're interested in exactly what you are describing in uh, your, your chapter. Um, uh, a new ecology with with the cartography um, and also with this temporal comparison that comes up in uh, the, the third chapter in the landscape of history. So those instances when certain groups of people that are making contact with new peoples and, and natures um, sort of use comparison or comparative practices in a specific way. So they, they use specific images, they use a language, they draw on existing discourses and kind of have to build new ones or the, because the, it's new, what they're seeing is new. And so this kind of, um, yeah, uh, sort of back and forth between, you know, having to put something new into familiar terms and comparing this is kind of at the core of what we're looking at and um i've come to the right place i think um it's, um yeah I should just we, are, we are we are so happy to have you it's, um so i'm and i'm just gonna pick your brain on this now so um the the two instances instances i mean there were many instances in your book that i saw you know oh wow okay another instance of comparison or practices of comparing but the two most pertinent ones i thought was the cartography and what you said, like what you mentioned analogous reading in, in that context, and maybe you can explain a little bit more um, the, you know, sort of, yeah, the mechanisms of that. And then also this, this temporal comparison, this is something I think interests me and many of my colleagues quite a bit, so that um, Europeans started looking at their own history in order to sort of understand the, the sort of development of the, the peoples they were seeing or yeah, or what they were imagining they were seeing. Um, so yeah, could you uh, sort of say that, or kind of specify a little bit, uh, can you make out sort of like communities of practice, or are there specific... Okay, well let me try. Let me try. I mean, um, we, may yeah. be, we may be divided by how we're going to talk about this, okay, point, but good. you lead me to, to the right place. Yeah. So let's talk about cartography. Yeah. Okay, so, so part of what the question is, is what is the function of a map? I mean, and when it, we talk about the function of it, we know from people who studied historical cartography that any visual representation of the world um, is going to represent certain political or economic ideas, right? So that's sort of there. Um, when we talk about cartography, we tend to imagine, we tend to think about something that we can see with our eyes. There were Native peoples who also mapped nature, but they mapped nature in a way that, that they would it would go through oral expression. It was still a form of mapping. Uh, and it was mapping which very much took into account not just a physical place in general, but a physical place at a certain time. Yeah. So for example, and you can see this especially in the northern parts of North America, how do you get from this town to this lake, right? How do you, how do you traverse that distance? Well, traversing that distance uh, requires some knowledge of the terrain and some knowledge of the risk that someone is going to pose and that is going to change by the season. And so there is sort of a way of talking about place which, in, which embeds in it a temporal element, right? At a certain season, you know, in the third month of the year, in the month of whatever, you know, the month of the raven or the month of the, when the eagle first shows up, right? You can go here, but you have to turn here because otherwise you're going to end up in 30 feet of snow, right? Because we know where these things are, but those things change over the course of the year. So I start with the native at a native example to sort of go back to the European, which we're more familiar with. So the function of a European map in the 16th century, European maps of the Americas in particular, is there's a sense, there's much in the Americas that we want to get, whatever that is. 
right? And, you know, from the time you read Columbus's first letter, yeah. when he publishes in 1493 onward, there is embedded in a lot of European texts, this is a place with great natural resources that we can get. Now, a lot of things flow from that idea. How do we get them? Who can claim them? Where Who can take them? Where are they? All sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big debate that's going on and will continue to go on for centuries. But the specific debate that our cartographer has, the specific issues, is how do I describe this place to get someone from Portugal to Brazil? All right. mm -hmm. What is the most important thing to tell that person? What's the most important thing to tell someone selling out of London and heading to Virginia? Right. What do they need to know? Well, if you think about it in the context of, of a sailor, what they need, what sailors more or less need to know is they need to know how winds work to the extent that that can be known. And they need to know what's going to be dangerous for them. Uh, and what's going to be most dangerous for them is what they're going to find near coastlines. And so a lot of the early maps that we have tend to be very detailed, or at least presumptively detailed, about the coastline. Right? Because if you are if you're a European and you cross the Atlantic Ocean, especially if you're in a single ship, cross the Atlantic Ocean and that o and that ship goes aground, you're not going home. You may not make it. Now, if, if you go in a group of ships, this happened with Columbus, three ships went, one went down, they fixed it up, two would go back. This kind of thing happens time and again. But they're trying to understand the risks and the dangers. Okay, so fair enough. On one level, then, a European map should be to plot how do I get from a to B, right? How do I get from Spain to Mexico? The earliest information that comes over is about the coastline and what's right there. But then there are these map makers who are trying to make a political argument, right? Well, why should we do this? Here's a bunch of reefs and shoals and it's rocky and what's the point? They create entire interiors for these maps. They create an entire visual language to describe what the travelers claim they saw. And so there are these great paintings. And so the second chapter of the book is primarily about a, a, a mid 16th century atlas, which is at the Huntington, yes. called the Villard of the Vallard. There's a debate about how to say the name of it. Comparison with their own history to make sense of what they're seeing and to suggest a model for cultural evolution that would follow. If those people who painted themselves blue or tattooed became us, the early modern English, then imagine what these people, who were so much more advanced over the Picts, could become. With and the right kind of with the, education. With the right kind of education. Yeah. And so when you look at those pictures, you know, those pictures uh, that were produced in the printed version of the book, uh, a lot of them follow white, uh, but they're adapted from white. And you can see that the engravers, that's a bride and the others who worked in the workshop, are altering the images as well. And they're altering the images, again, for sort of historical reasons. So all of a sudden you have people who were, uh, who white painted, uh, presumably what he saw. I mean, he's a classically trained artist. So now in the engraved version, they look like they've just walked out of some ancient Roman texts with perfect bodies, perfect posing, the perfect Renaissance elbow, you know, all these kinds of things to say, look, these people are going to become us. And again, it's a reference to what happened in the past, now recycled for modern day political reasons. Okay, and kind of also sort of projecting that, that European uh, Renaissance or almost appropriating those peoples with that image or imagery kind of drawing it into that European um, kind of way of looking as well possibly. Absolutely, yeah. no, it's a perfect yeah. European way of looking and yeah. it's a way of looking which presumes both the superiority of a European way of living and the naturalness of getting there, right? There was nothing before Europeans arrived, native peoples uh, were inferior in various ways, but they were not malevolent. They didn't know better. This is the European view. Once Europeans arrive and sort of say, aha, we're going to bring you forward anthropologically, we're going to bring you forward culturally, then things change. And it was after that initial encounter, especially in North America, that things often went downhill in terms of relations with Europeans, and it was because of European disappointment 
that natives were not changing the ways that Europeans had presumed that civilizations would based on their, as Europeans' understanding, of the evolution of what was then, what, 2,000 years of European history. Yeah. I thank you very much for being here at the conference, here for the interview, um, and thank you. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about the book and for meeting with you again. And I'm delighted to be here for the conference over the next couple of days. So thank, thank you very much. Thanks.